thank you for coming with the weather, with the rugby match. Um, I mean, I, I think to me that seemed actually an appropriate way to start to think about um, the similarities between both of your work, actually, because in a sense, I mean, I, I hopefully some of you got a chance to go into the show before the talk. If not, I guess those who haven't will see it after. But it's quite it's a very lively show. There's the first thing you'll probably notice is how much is going on in terms of different media. You know, you've got video, you've got drawing, you've got photography, you've got painting. There's, yeah, a, light, a lovely, lively mix there. But um, what I want to start with, I guess, was this idea that we are here in this room, um, given the weather, um, you know, between the second and the third Brexit deal votes. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the day after, you know, it, the terrorism incident in New Zealand and um, and so I guess to think about this idea of or the question of whether art is kind of separate from life or like is art a haven from the world and I think both of you guys kind of deal with that question quite directly which I think which so that was kind of an umbrella um, thing to think about over the next you know minutes that we're here I suppose but what I wanted to start with I guess was just actually with beginnings a very basic question given that you work in so many mediums, both of you, like just the simple, where do things start? How do you decide what form an idea should take? What do, what do you begin with, I guess, if you don't? Well, you know, uh, I guess traditionally artists have started in the history of art, you know, of having patronage and then you had like maybe some artists got into landscape and then some artists chose wine bottles and oranges as still lives and stuff. And contemporary art has really got in, a lot of more contemporary art has got into looking at the culture, the real culture you live in, not just part of it. I mean, when, when people like Goya painted royalty, um, um, there was other things going on. And he's a very good example of someone who also painted wars. So, but most of artists that were, were patrons of religion and, and royalty um, uh, didn't, often didn't touch on other things. But I think what, the thing that Mark and I have in common is we, we both work off of um, uh, popular culture in so many ways. We, we both, um, um, Mark's done a lot of work off of heavy metal. I've worked with David Bowie in The Clash. Um, and we have lots of other th uh, things in common, the idea of using many different medias. Um, you know, as a, as a teacher um, in, art, in school, art schools, um, there's sort of questions, that if you've taught for 40 years, there's certain questions, there's certain things that students always ask, and you think, oh, okay. And one question is, um, you know, I've, I've got this great idea for a, I want to do this work, and I'm, I'm not sure what medium to use. And I say to them, look, you may think my answer's simple, simplistic, but basically you use the medium that best suits the idea. You know, Don't make an etching of it if it would make a better documentary film. You know, I mean, it's, it's um, you know. And, and those are the things that I think artists like Mark and I deal with, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you look at that exhibition in there, um, we've both used fabric. Mark with the flags, me, me with the tapestry. Um, we both use video. We both use stone in there. We've got, so, you know, I've gone on too long, sorry. No, no, no. I, I totally concur with what you say. I, I was really fortunate in that, I mean, I, the, my sort of primary art schooling was in the mid-90s, um, where, um, and so I went through art school and through a course at the time when no one was asking you to be a painter, no one's asking you to be a sculptor, no one's asking you to be a printmaker, it was just be an artist. And exactly what you said there, um, it was ideas driven, it was about um, kind of uh, arriving at the right form for the thing that it would take. And so, so I came out of that education just never thinking, never thinking beyond the actual piece that I was making, if that makes any sense, in terms of um, what what form this will take it will find its own form as, as the idea generates and so um, and then in terms of kind of where the ideas begin and again I would I would kind of I'm in the position where I can kind of add this into my bag of things that have really specifically influenced me as an artist is that um, 
uh, I first saw, there's a fantastic documentary um, made by Ken Russell in 62. It was made in 61, but Six went out in May 60. Yeah, which, <laughs> which, I'm, which I'm sure many people in this room will have seen. Called That's Pop, 1962, Pop not 18. Yeah, right. <laughs> And um, it's called Pop Goes the Easel. I think you can still watch it on iPlayer at the moment. And, um, and I'm genuinely, I, my um, uh, art teacher, um, when I was maybe 17 years old, showed us that because he was completely obsessed with David Hockney. Sorry, De uh, Derek. Um, but um, so I, that was my first introduction to Derek. And, and uh, there's a beautiful moment in that where um, your moment where you're sat literally at the breakfast table and you're pouring out your cornflakes and the little plastic toy falls out and you say, I think for, I think for the Englishman, um, their relationship with America starts at the breakfast table and you've got the cornflakes and the plastic toy and that kind of stuff. And that's really true for me in the development of my own work in that I, I've kind of realised that a lot of what I do as an artist is maybe selfishly, it's a, it's a way for me to try and interpret this crazy mess of a place that we live and exist and everything that's going on around us. And so it's literally drawn from the landscape of what I see around me to try and, to try and make sense of this stuff somehow. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess you both use recognisable figures, icons, brands, characters, and I guess... I mean, that same quote actually was kind of made me have this question uh, in my mind of a maybe, I don't know if distance is the right word, but this sense of like approaching something. So like the way you talked about your work at that time being a kind of way of analyzing American influence and American cultural influence in Britain at that point. And, and say, I think with some of the bands, I think that you've worked with the things that these ideas of like approaching from a distance maybe. And I, I, I don't know if that's a question in the sense of like, how can we, do we talk about distance and proximity in your work in a sense of like yeah. how we can internalize something or how we see culture from a distance and how we get to know it? Yeah, I think, I think you must pair that with different types of artists, but all artists basically are curious. You know, I think you've got to have curiosity. I, I heard a great quote recently that, and I used it, I did a lecture uh, back at my old grammar school in Sherborne in Dorset. And I th found a very, uh, several appropriate uh, quotes. Um, and one was, in connected to this, it's, and especially to young people, don't try to make yourself interesting. Mm -hmm. Try to make yourself interested, you know, i.e. be curious because curiosity is the basic of all creativity. You know, what the hell, you know, as you say, what's, what's going on, <laughs> you know, what is it? Um, and, the, but different artists bring different aspects of curiosity. I mean, for instance, you ask about distance. Um, I was thinking the other day that I've made art um, often about countries that I visited. I've made art in Israel about Israel and Jewish culture. I've made art about it, Hungary and Czechoslovakia. I've made, hungry, I've made things obviously about the United Kingdom and Wales and, uh, and, and Mer America and um, every, practically, and I've made work about Japan, all the countries I visited. But another artist who, you know, good artist, interesting artist might go to those countries you know, not take anything from it. Um, and that's fine too, you know, or some maybe, maybe a totally abstract artist would go to Japan and find something that would influence the direction of their, their abstraction takes. It's just, you know, there's many, many different, there should be as many different styles. There's, um, what was it, Frank Geary, the architect who did um, um, the, the um, Bilbao, um, um, Guggenheim in building in Bilbao and the Disney Hall in LA. Um, apparently, he used to always start his classes off when he taught. He'd say to everyone, Okay, everyone, here's a sheet of paper. Will you sign your name? And he pinned them on the wall. He said, Look at those differences. They're all different. Look at his signatures. They're different. You, all your art should be that different. That's good. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, on, on that, I mean, it's another thread, I guess, out of the, um, you know, this, this whole project has come out of this literal conversation between me and Derek. And, and it's another thread which kind of links our practices that we've both taught throughout our careers as well. And, um, and just to pick up on something that Derek said there, it's a conversation that I have constantly with my students even now is that they understand that art schools are kind of slightly overwhelming place when people first arrive. And it's that, you know, what, what do I do next? Particularly so many people coming straight from school now rather than foundation. And, um, and I find myself time and time and time and time again just saying, what are you into? Like, what are you interested in? You know, you don't have to be looking around for some kind of divine inspiration and pull some heavy, heavy idea out of the ether to then attempt to sound like you're a serious artist. It's like, if you like EastEnders, make work about EastEnders. If you like dog shows, make work about dog shows. It's like the, the work will always um, say something about the world and will be more powerful and a vehicle for you if you're actually drawing from something that you truly care about and that you truly know about. And so um, just it's that really basic thing about what you're into. Yeah, well, and I think that's, I guess, that was partially what I was thinking in, in terms of situating us in time in this room as well, is a sense of, I mean, it's obvious that cultural manipulation matters, you know, it, it has an effect in the world. And so, it, and, and you both seem to be paying attention in certain ways, but also kind of sometimes crossing the wires, sometimes amplifying things. I, I was curious maybe to see how you guys saw yourselves in that respect. Well, I, I have one story that's to do with choice. Um, so I taught in, um, I taught for 13 years in the University of H in Houston, Texas. And I had one student there, and there was a student there who was a very nice person. She was called Doris. She could have been a David, but she was Doris. And the thing about Doris was she, with every tutor that talked to her, she always was keen, and she'd say to every tutor, oh, Oh, thank you. Oh, God. Oh, that was so useful. Thank you so much. But she would never, ever take the advice. <laughs> it, it was, it, you just knew you were talking. It was to such an extent that in the faculty room, um, at the beginning of the semester, we'd get the list of the, our students. And we'd be looking at our faculty, and someone would go, Oh, no. And someone would say, you got Doris. <laughs> so um, I had Doris. Uh, I taught her, actually, in her first year. And I taught her throughout. And I taught her on the last semester of her last year. And she came to me and she said, Derek, I've got to tell you something. She said, I've, I've, I, you know, everything I've learned in four years is coming together. I know I'm going to do the most amazing work. I just know. I, I said, oh. And I said, well, good, good. I said, what, what, what do you want to talk about? What's the problem? She said, well, I can't decide what to paint. Well, I said, yeah, <laughs> that is a problem. Um, yeah, you know, and I, I'll, I'll make the story a bit longer and not shorten it. But I said to her, look, they say if you can't sleep at night, four o'clock in the morning, get up, put the lights on, read a book. It's going to make you fall asleep. And then make a list of what's things that are worrying you. You can't stop your Uncle Jack and your Auntie Maisie coming for a visit. You can't stop, stop the Third World War. Oh, no, 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 she said, I've done all that. She said, I'm just down to two things. Oh, now you're talking. Tell me the two things and we can talk about them. She said, I can't decide whether to paint geometric shapes or men with erections. <laughs> I told. Well, I told my uh, my dealer, my gallery dealer at the time, and I told her the story. And she said, Derek, and I said, you know, she'll never do it. <laughs> and I said, yeah. My dealer said, you should do it. So I did a series of drawings. <laughs> yeah. So when we ask where your ideas come from. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, your ideas steal them from other students. I mean, it was Picasso who said, wasn't Picasso said something about, you know, don't just look at other people, steal their ideas. But also that idea um, of figuring out 
what to listen to and what not to listen to. You know, it sounds like Doris just didn't listen to anything. But, um, but actually, I think it's a really important thing you learn, again, right, through art school, isn't it, is that you get all these kind of opinions coming in. You have to take them on board in some way, and it's having the confidence to discard a lot of them, and, but recognise the ones which are worth taking on board. And again, even yesterday, you were telling me a story in the gallery here about that... Um, full page review that you oh, stumbled yeah. upon yeah. and um, I mean I'll, I'll, I, I won't oh yeah I mean it, it's like dealing or not dealing with your, your vanity or something uh, in, within one morning I had two phone calls in London uh, when I was living in London uh, and someone said oh Derek have you seen the latest edition of um, uh, Studio International and I said no and he said, well, you, you've got a full page um, review plus a reproduction. I said, oh, that's nice. And then someone else called. So vanity got the best of me slightly. So later in the day, I went up to Smith's and I bought a copy. And sure enough, oh, God, yeah, full page in colour. Oh, that's good. Start to read it. Oh, it's interesting. Oh, hang on, what's he saying? What's he? <laughs> and basically what he said is... Derek Bosher is an artist who looks as though he doesn't know how his work appears to other people. And I mean, that's the worst thing you could say about an artist, really. And I thought, well, arsehole, you? And then, and then, of course, you read it and you say, oh, shit, maybe he's right. <laughs> and, you know, and actually, that's the best sort of reviews that you can ever have, is something you learn from, you know, because... Um, I'll just stray a bit because I remember my worst review I ever had and it was actually in Time Out magazine and it was a show I had at the ICA in London in the 80s, uh, 82, I think, 83 and it was a review in Time Out and the reviewer did something unprecedented to have a review one week and then Time magazine came out next week and they reviewed it again and it was even worse review than the first week and the, the last sentence of the last review said Derek Bosch's paintings are so bad that he makes Julian Schnabel look like Rembrandt <laughs> so, you know, but that, I mean that's not useful that's just you know you don't take that seriously you can't take that seriously Hello, my daughters have arrived. <laughs> Hi. Um, but that was maybe something to think about in the sense of, um, I mean, you, you both seem to act as sort of cultural filters and cultural amplifiers, I guess, is a sort of, and, and it was like, how do you choose what to amplify? Um, how do you feel what you, you should put forward in this way? Well, I think you, it depends on the situation. You know, I think, um, you know, you, you evaluate the event, I mean, and then you think how you would deal with it. I mean, you don't want to be too corny about it either, you know. And on the other hand, you don't want to hide behind some, you know, th um, you know perhaps an un unapproachable theoretical point. I think somewhere you reach the... the, the, the communicational point that's good for you or, or what you're good at, of, you know. Mm. I, I found, for instance, um, I mean, I do use digital um, uh, material. I, I make all my films on, on an iPad and I do have an editor I work with, uh, have work, or different editors have worked with to, to make the films. But basically, I found what I'm good at or I think I'm good at or I am most comfortable with it I'm a hands-on artist I, I like the use of the hand to make marks um, now interestingly Mark is that's the one point that we some of us have difference because yeah, Mark yeah. makes gets other we collaborates with people <laughs> oh yeah yeah cheat yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, the, quite extensively in this show, actually, um, which more so than normal. I mean, uh, often when I have a solo show, it'll end up being roughly kind of 50-50 between um, uh, kind of very hands-on making of my own and, and working with, um, with fabricators, other people. But, um, but I genuinely, the relationships that I develop with the people that I work with, 
I've I've learned how um, uh, how kind of um, how important they are actually within within the work. I mean, there are certain people that I go to who flat out they've got a skill I've not got, so I ask them to make something for me that I wouldn't be able to make otherwise. Um, but then there are other people who. Um, yeah, you really, there's a back and forth. There's a very particular back and forth in the development of those things. And, and I'd, I'd cite the, um, the large painted work in my show as a case in point in that this is the second time I've worked with, it's a chap called Chris Gadd, who, um, who lives in Puthcall. Um, so only 30 minutes down the road from me in Cardiff. And it was purely coincidental that Chris lived there. I, it was a couple of years ago, I had an idea for work and I, I knew that I wanted it knew that I wanted to work with a fairground ride painter on it and had kind of held, held, had this desire for a number of years and the, the time was right, the work was right for that. So I was just researching online to try and find someone to do it. Came across Chris, thought, wow, this is the guy. And then genuinely he happened to live half an hour down the road from me. And so it was clearly meant to be. Um, and how that then works is that, um, you know, I, I kind of go to Chris, we, we discuss what my idea is, quite literally what, what the uh, kind of concept and narrative is behind the work, and I draw out a, a kind of a rough, um, uh, a, a rough composition and give him loads of um, kind of visual reference of different elements within it. And then there's a, a period then that he is working with it where he brings his fairground ride sensibility to it, you know, because actually the, the skill he's got is not just as a guy who's incredibly talented at painting with, uh, with, a, um, with an airbrush. It's that understanding of how you work on that kind of scale and, um, and how you make these things really, really pop. And so, and I particularly remember in the first piece that we did together, all the kind of elements were there and, and it, was a, it was a very, very apocalyptic piece. And um, well, not dissimilar to this in that sense, but, um, and he came back and he said, oh, you know, in the fairground, what we would do is all these bits here, we would join them up with, you know, kind of uh, almost like lightning bolts and things like that. It was like, there we go, do that. <laughs> and, and actually, and that back and forth is, is really, um, is really valuable. And so it's why I'm very happy to, to talk about the people that I work with on these things, because whilst ultimately the authorship is, is mine and I put it out in the world as this thing that I've created in my exhibition, Chris is there, you know, and that, that relationship and that collaboration is, is really, really important in how, how these things develop. Yeah, I've worked with, um, I also have done a lot of collaboration. I've, I worked a lot with the, with the poet Christopher Logue, um, and I've worked with um, someone, a New York writer called Ed Hirsch, and we've done a lot of things together. And I've also worked with um, um, people, um, pr pr pre, um, um, what's the computer thing? Shop. Photoshop. Photoshop. Pre-Photoshop, <laughs> I have worked with photo retouchers, and that, that was good. And of course, when I w had worked in films, my early films, I had worked with, in fact, the f one of the films I made um, called Circle in 70, um, 1970, I think it was. And there's a whole sequence where... Um, um, there's a sequence where it starts off in the sky, which is just a sky, and then in comes an aeroplane. And the aeroplane goes out and the camera pans down and comes to the top of a, of a flagpole. And we go right down the flagpole and we come to a building. And on the building, there's a, it's an Art Nouveau building and there's an angel. And you go down and the angel and it's like, probably a 15-storey building, and we come to the freeway, and the cars are going this way, and then we go down to the columns that are keeping the freeway up, and then we go into the, the curb, and we pan along the curb, and there's a toy plane, and it takes off. Well, the point about that is, um, you know, I got someone, I explained to someone, a filmmaking friend, that I, well, I was going to do that, and he said, that's difficult. I got a guy, we usually use this guy as a cameraman, just for this section. Anyway, I used this guy. I mean, that's an amazing thing to do, hand done. If you think of what I've just described. Um, anyway, um, I, people who've seen the films always say, God, that was a great shot. And I said, yeah, I didn't do it. <laughs> and. Um, Someone said to me, who, who did it? And I told him, and they say, you know, he's the greatest cameraman in Britain. <laughs> I was just lucked out, because I was actually working with trade unions. At the time, I did some work with trade unions. And um, 
it was a trade union friend who said, oh, we can get this guy. So collaboration sometimes comes in, you know, fortuitous. Right. I, I find myself, I know um, whenever, often when I'm, if I'm giving a talk at university or something like that, talking about my, um, the work, more often than not, the work will be on a slide behind me, but what I find myself talking about are the, um, is all the surrounding stuff, like the anecdotes and, the, and talking about the relationship that I developed with this person. It's, it's, it's just all that other stuff that the production of the work ultimately generates in the real world as well. I think it's just as important and just as interesting. Yeah. I think that's what seems coming out from what you guys are saying as well, the sense of the work and the way it relates to the world. It's not just that the work is something that's enclosed in itself or that you're just sort of taking something away from the world. It's also the way it interacts with what we all know or what we don't, you know, shared... I think, I think there's one other thing we share in common, and that is um, we are not artists who... And, it's, it's, you know, different artists work... I'm not criticising the opposite at all. And different artists work in different ways to make their art and to get their art out there. I think particularly Mark and I are built into our modus operandi is the fact that we aim our work at the public more. It's not my, you know, the work that was least to do with that was abstract expressionism. It was always pouring out the soul and stuff. Good work, I'm not criticizing the work, but I'd say where that came, up, came from was that, you know, sense of self uh, and going out, which is fine. Um, but I'm just saying that Mark and I have a, I mean, we have that self thing too, and of course no artist doesn't. I mean. In a way, every artist's work is a self-portrait in some way or another. Um, but th that idea that Mark and I are spe specifically interested in our work, reaching an audience um, outside, often outside the artwork, we both work with pop groups, so that, both, that made our work accessible outside of the art world. That's, that's another... Um, uh, way of working, you you get it's different a audience. Conversational sort of tone, I guess, rather than some, you know, if you have a sense of direction of like. Well, also anyone that, especially anyone that works in photography and video, also has an advantage because that that's a totally accessible public um, arena. You know, people are used to watching films and television, so if you make something that moves <laughs> and has a soundtrack, I think that attracts people other than the art world, so, yeah. Well, I think, and also, I mean, you both use, I think there's quite a lot of humor, I think, in the work as well, you know, the sense of, I mean, I don't know if caricature is the right word, but there's this sense of things becoming sort of larger than life as a way of talking about it as well. Yeah. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Totally, I mean, my, my undergrad thesis was all about, um, uh, focused a lot on Dada and humour in art and things like that and actually because I, I would always cite again when I talk about my work I cite alternative comedy as a massive influence on me as a, as a person growing up and just that um, uh, the, the, the power of satire and humour to have to make really um, really significant points in the world and and that's something that's um, yeah that, that's that's been with me since kind of undergrad years and I think I continue to engage with I think it's really important um, and uh, because, I mean, again, to sort of pick up on the previous point in some ways, it is important to me that people um, who aren't necessarily of um, an arts educated background can potentially um, experience my work and hopefully get something from it. You know, I don't, I've, I have no interest in putting things out in the world which are so, um, so esoteric or navel gazing that they are, they're, they're kind of completely self-contained um, um, within, within themselves. I, I, I am populist enough in my soul, I guess, to, to want people to, um, to, to have a way in, and sometimes that might be a visual, sometimes it might be a title, sometimes it might be you know, a piece of audio that's playing in the background or whatever, but I think it's important that those things are there, um, that are references that, that you know, um, arguably anyone could pick up on and, and begin to unpick the work if they want to on some level. Uh, in, in Shakespeare, in, Shakespeare in King Lear says, King Lear says, that devil humour. So he knew, you know, and it's funny because they always had gestures. But the other thing about uh, maybe we do have in common also is the fact that um, it's only fairly recently, in, you know, I'm also obviously, you know, 
I can't ever shake off being a pop artist. I mean, I mean, it's good and bad. I mean, I'm glad I was involved in it and stuff like that. So I've done lots of interviews, and and, and there's been lots of written about pop art. But it's only recently that that what's come to the fore is that much of the this particular generation, not 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 the earlier ones, but the Royal College of Art, David Hockney, Alan Jones. Um, Pauline Boaty, um, 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 Pat, uh, Patrick Crawford, and myself were all working class kids. It was it, uh, the, the working class um, background has played a big part in po in popular culture, and I think it plays part in our lives too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I mean, so we're building up. I mean, it, in this talk we're having, I think we're building up little bits and pieces of all the things that eventually contribute to being an artist and to being an artist of a particular type. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess I grew up in the American suburbs um, and so maybe the, the kind of notion of distance that I talked on earlier is something to me that relates to that in this egalitarian um, maybe ethos or principle, I guess. But um, I've, like in thinking the pop goes the easel film that we mentioned earlier where you're talking about infiltration of culture and, and I, I was curious to ask how you felt now after living in the US for so long in terms of whether you've infiltrated there and whether maybe the class issues there are in the same, you know, whether they trigger similar things for you there or whether it's different in terms of cultural perception. No. Well, what I've come to realize is, is, you know, there's no difference basically because, you know, you got Brexit, we got Trump, you know, or, or I got Trump and Brexit as well. So, and you know, people say, how do you deal with Trump? You say, well, you dealt with Margaret Thatcher. So, I mean, it's, uh, the differences are between people, not, not, not so, much, so much cultures. I mean, on extreme, yes, North, North Korea and South are different, but, um, that's why, uh, I mean, I've no, I noticed a lot of, um, I've noticed a little bit lately about a lot of fem feminist artists who say, you know, I don't want to be called a feminist artist. No, I, I'm an artist, you know, uh, you know, not. And so, you know, that's up to the individual artist to decide what category they want to be in. Um, again, the uh, similarity to Mark and I, I think, is we're hard to put in a category, you know. There, there's certain movements. I mean, now especially, you know, I'm 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 not forever a pop artist, you know. I happen to be, you know, at that time. But I think what I what I've always been interested. In, several things I've been interested in artists is actually not repeating myself. I mean, I feel. Oh, I've done that. I, I don't want to do more on that. People always say to me, you should do some more of those 60s pop paintings. You make a fortune. You know, fucking boring. <laughs> so. Which, I mean, to pick up on that is something which I would say, the, I mean, I'm sitting here with two hats on in some ways because I've curated Derek's show and having my own show. And so I, I kind of went into the task of curating Derek's show with um, sort of knowing after our initial conversations what I wanted to draw um, draw kind of out of this um, for him um, and and so there's that um, kind of very political um, uh, kind of uh, connection in that ways but there's um, there's a, an essay that we've commissioned alongside the show as well which is going to be in a publication which should be here in a couple of weeks because we're including um, installation shots and so it's why it's not here but and, and by a, a mutual friend of ours actually the guy that introduced me and Derek in the first place a writer called Jonathan Griffin who lives in Los Angeles now but is from the UK originally and um, and he says in that um, that he he has often thought of me as a pop artist and Derek just as a straight-up contemporary artist and um, and I thought that was really interesting that Jonathan would would would, exactly, yeah, kind of put us out in that way. Um, but also, and the, the, the distance thing, to step back again, um, you know, Derek's from Portsmouth. I grew up on the north coast of Kent. And that, um, that growing up in a decentralised place, I think, has, I know has played a really profound, uh, had a really profound effect on, on my work and how I uh, kind of view the world. And actually, I think we're, we're sitting in many ways in the ideal um, uh, seaside town to have this conversation in that I realised um, some years after 
um, leaving university that um, the, the dynamic of the seaside town that I grew up in was a really important um, kind of element within my work in that, you know, you've got um, May to October, it's sunny and bright and shiny and there's loads of people around and there's candy floss and everything's open and the arcades are noisy and bright and shiny. October, all the shutters come down and it starts raining and it doesn't stop till May and everything's closed and you're a kid in this town going, okay, so it was bright and shiny and now it's just miserable and grey and I have to deal with this for six months. And those two really opposing states of the town that I grew up in, I suddenly realised that um, that's, that's really present in my work, I think, actually, the, the, those kind of extremes and, and um, connected oppositions, I guess. I have a follow-up to that. Um, you know, David Hockney, uh, we see, because David looked at me, I was at college with him and I've known him for what, 62 years, and um, he also lives in Los Angeles, but you know, he, he has a place in Yorkshire, and I went up to visit him in, oh God, what's the name of the place? What's David's, what's David's place in Yorkshire? Bridlington. Bridlington, Bridlington. So I went up to Bridlington to stay with him about five or six years ago, and the house is great, and uh, it's, you know, um, it's an incredibly comfortable house. It used to be a hotel, and he bought it for his mother. Um, and um, one day I got up, one more day I was there, and I got up and I went down, and it was like 8 o'clock or 8.30, and there's no one about. And I'm thinking, OK, well, David, you always got about six newspapers, so I'm reading the newspapers, and it's like 9.50, and I think, well, and I'm hungry, so I make myself some breakfast. And I think, what, where are they gone? They can't have, well, I mean, they would have told me if they went to the studio early. So that was, anyway, I went off. So I had a meal, I don't know, it's 10 o'clock. So it's, it's like the, the weather was not quite as bad as today, but it was Bridlington in, I don't know, February or something. And it was like pelt rain, you know, wind and rain like here. And I, I thought, well, I'll go along the promenade and have a walk. So I walk along the equivalent to the um, parade here or the crescents here. And I'm walking along, and there's all these, exactly the same as here, all these hotels and B&Bs. And they've all got notices in saying, no vacancies. And I'm thinking, who the hell comes up to Britain? <laughs> <laughs> it's just winter for holiday. So um, that was fine, and I went back. And later in the day, the sun came out a bit, and I was driving with David in his convertible, and I was driving past the same place. And I said, David, I said, I mean, no vacancies. And David said, that doesn't mean no vacancies. It means gone to Mallorca. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't want to admit that, you know, yeah. But it's the same, yeah. Same seaside town stories. Well, I guess for me, it's, it's like what, what perspective that gives you from outside a kind of central mainstream perspective, I guess, in the sense of what you pay attention to and what you, you attune to, I guess, in the sense of what strikes you as appropriate or funny or ironic or odd. Or, you know, that's, I think it's, it's more what seems to be a sensibility you both have in terms of how you critique things and what you choose to pay attention to shaped by that sense of what I would call distance, but I don't know. Well, yeah. I'm. I've got a few projects down the line, for instance. I'm, I started actually two or three years ago, and then we broke off for, for various reasons. Well, and um, that is, I'm, I'm working on a children's book, and I'm working with a physicist who was a Nobel Prize winner two years ago and for phys uh, for physicist. And um, we're doing a book, a children's book, that's trying to get children interested in science and that's good and uh, um, it was good and we, my partner Thelma behind we had a lunch with him and you know soon after he won the Nobel Prize and we said to him c c c do you think you could describe what you why you how you got the Nobel Prize <laughs> And he was incredibly good. What he did, he got the Nobel Prize for proving one more thing that um, Einstein had said, and that 
was it gravity, sounding gravity or something, one of, one of Einstein's theories he, he proved to be true. And he actually described it, he said it's, it's not going to be a simple explanation, but he took us stage by stage, and I'm, I'm totally unmathematical, unscientific, but it was so good. It's the other thing, isn't it? That, um, I don't know, I'm sure Mark's the same. I just love people who are experts. I don't care what it is. I don't care if they're <laughs> dog trainers or, you know, whatever it is. I just, I mean, people who are good at, you know, good at gardening, anything is, is so interesting to hear it. Absolutely, it comes back to those collaborations. Um, and I, I, I had the absolute joy a few years ago of working with, I mean, it's been mentioned that I'm, I'm a, a lifelong rock music fan and heavy metal has, has kind of fed into my work quite a lot. I did a project where I worked with a chap called Nick Barker, who um, is the, um, arguably one of the world's best um, uh, extreme metal drummers. And he was in a band called Cradle of Filth, if that's a reference point for anybody in the room. Um, and, um, and Nick's just extraordinary. And we spent um, quite an intense period of time hanging out in um, Berwick-on-Tweed uh, Berwick where we were doing the project, because Nick's constantly touring the world. He's in about four different bands who are all doing very well. And we kind of had this window where we were going to do this performance. And we spent a few days together and it was just the, the real joy for that. I mean, the, the, the work was incredible, actually. The performance that came out of it really was in, amazing. But for me, um, being slightly obsessed with the subject, Nick's the same age as me, this is the other thing as well, was just hanging out with him for those few days and the stories that he had about his experiences of, of kind of existing in that world and doing what he does. I mean, just very quickly, I'll tell this one story, which is an example of a guy who's kind of at the top of his uh, profession in that, um, Nick's in a, one of the bands that Nick's in, the guitarist is in, also in a band in Chile who are, who are massive and uh, really, really very popular in Chile and they were supporting Metallica at some festival, I'm sure people have heard of Metallica and, and so um, and Nick got a phone call one day from, uh, from Anton the guitarist saying Nick, Nick, our drummer's just left and we're supporting Metallica in three days time, can you come and do the gig? And so Nick was like yeah okay fine and so he literally got a tape of the songs got on a plane to Chile, listened to the songs for 14 hours on the flight to Chile, making little notes as he does for himself, which he hangs on a drum monitor, and literally stepped off the plane, went to an arena, and did a gig in front of 80,000 people, <laughs> having never rehearsed with this band before. And that's extraordinary, right? And I just love being around people like that. It's just <laughs> it's an absolute joy. Um, so could you do that? <laughs> <laughs> what would be the artistic? Yeah, exactly. That? <laughs> um, I, so I, maybe this is kind of unrelated, but I guess sort of a follow-on question for me in my head in terms of um, collaboration, not collaboration, exaggeration, I guess, in the sense of um, the humor I was talking about earlier. Is this, um, uh, and if we're talking about kind of reflecting the world or filtering the world, um, if, if there's a sense of, uh, hyper hyperbole or over the topness, I think, in some of your work. But it, I, I wonder if that, how that measures up. Like, does it get more difficult to get hyperbolic when the world is itself hyperbolic? <laughs> I don't know if there's a simple way to ask that question. There probably is, but in the sense of like, you know, like say with the paintings with the iPads in front of the pyramid and things like that, where it's just like that. It's totally a recognizable scene. Um, and I had a, a great moment earlier where I was standing in front of the painting, and then a guy stepped in front of me to kind of like hold up his phone to, <laughs> to take a picture of it. So I've got a, a picture yeah. of him doing that as well. But the uh, great, the, the, there's it may be a bit of that. The great um, Oprah, there's a great Oprah Winfrey story. She talks about how she's walking down the street. And someone comes up to her and said, "Oprah, Oprah, how, can I have a, can I have a, no, uh, can I have a selfie with you? Can I do a selfie?" And Oprah went and said, "Look, I'm so late for an interview. I'm going to get in so much trouble. I could just pose for you if you like. I could just stand." And the woman said, "I don't want a photograph of you. <laughs> I mean, that's the selfie culture. You know, it's nothing to do with yeah, the yeah. person. It's yeah. you know, so." That that question I think is a is a is a really important question to be asking right now about the the, yeah. um, the 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 kind of the hyperbole and stepping up into it and how the work can do that. In that, yeah. um, there's um, you know in, in a very a very simple answer to that I would say that um, obviously I have a very particular worldview and when I find myself having to 
reference um, the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel to discuss the kind of things that I want to talk about, how I see the world, we know that we're in a pretty dire situation, right? <laughs> and and so um, that's that. I think that's the, the, um, a, a thing that I would reference here is a fantastic podcast that I listened to recently by um, uh, Sam Harris, and he was interviewing a chap called Timothy Schneider, who's written a book called um, On the Road to Tyranny. And this came out a couple of years ago now. I'm out of date with Sam Harris's series. But, and this guy, it's, it's called on, uh, on the Road to Tyranny, um, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. <clears throat> it's a very short book, and he just um, is drawing from what he believes we can learn from the 20th century um, in terms of what's going on in the world today. And, um, and it's, it's fantastic in that he's not being... Um, uh, he's not just... Um, over-egging the pudding and just kind of gut, offering gut responses to this stuff. He's, he's really relating this back to what's happened in the last couple of centuries in terms of what we see happening in the world today politically and where this could potentially go. And, you know, there's a lot of um, very dramatic um, uh, kind of statements get made about Trump, for example, and, and his kind of rise to power and these kind of things. And, um, but this, uh, what Timothy Snyder's saying is um, actually... You know, look back even further. Like, don't don't just look back to Hitler. Look look further back and look back to, for example, at the end of the um, end of the nineteenth century. Um, a uh, a globalization happened at that point in the same way as it happens now because of technology. We think that we're living in a time that globalization has never occurred like this before. Is that you've only got to look back to this point. <clears throat> there was a similar globalization occurring, um, and there was a similar mindset. There was a mindset that this will lead us to a better place. This will lead us to a more connected world where we will uh, we will you know we'll, we'll literally be more more linked and and it'll be good for humanity. Where that ended up was the First World War. And so, um, so yeah, I think um, the, the kind of political landscape that I find myself uh, disturbingly drawn to, to need to discuss in my work right now, it's reaching that point where, yeah, crikey, like how, how are we going to, how could I possibly push it further in my work than what we're seeing on a daily basis on the news? It's extraordinary. Well, also, um, the point about I, I blame the media a lot. Um, I mean, the popular media. I mean, where is... You never see uh, Noam Chomsky, who is, Noam Chomsky is one of the greatest thinkers and writers uh, from the left. You never see him on television. It's all, you know, different talking heads. I mean, it, it, there's no breadth in, in uh, uh, the communication. And I think, like Mark, I mean, I think uh, I make my work sometimes out of um, subduing my anger, <laughs> you know, I get, fuck, how did, how did they do that, I like, fuck them, and you know, that, you know, and you want to make a work that's, you know, and, you know, as, as, you know, actually in some write-ups about this show, someone quoted me, but actually, um, it's not quite quote, right, because I quoted someone else, and that is, um, make your art political, not political art so you know don't do that you know I mean it's um, although it, funny enough having said that I think what's happening in American sports about taking the knee that's good <laughs> yeah so um, hang on maybe maybe I'm wrong there so well but I guess in that sense of like if your work draws from the media you know do you look to other media then or you know what I mean or is it you're you know are we making this stuff to kind of alter it or subvert it or to reflect it? I guess it's this question of how we see what we're doing, you know, what's... Um... Well, I, yeah, this is an, an interesting question. Whether an artist can be influential um, politically, um, I think the answer is simply you do the best you can because if you look at art that is incredibly powerful politically it's terrible i mean the nazi party were experts i mean that the nazis visual propaganda was amazing and so was the communist party so was you know um mao zedong stuff uh, you know and you have to look you know in a way i don't think to answer your question i don't think you have to look to complete you, you have to do it on your scale, you know, and, um, uh, and that brings me to artists who do do um, 
more overtly uh, political art, and I and I find a lot of that art, not all, but I personally find a lot of art that has a lot of reading on the walls. Um, I always look at it and say, great, because I think you're a great artist. What you're thinking about and what you're trying to do, but you should be making a documentary film. It's just not, you're using the wrong medium. And especially if you want to attract an audience or get a, a non-art audience involved, I mean, those, a lot of those artists within the art world that have good reputations politically, they have it only in the art world. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're often not accessible outside of the art world. And their, their, their celebrity and fame or whatever is it, within the art world is, is kept within the art world. So I think you have to think about these things. It will be hard actually to outdo the Nazis. I mean, hor horrific as that sounds. Um, but they were good. I don't know what to add to that. <laughs> well, cause I guess maybe then, in th what I found interesting as well, maybe as a kind of more to think in the long view of like what lasts or not, is that, you know, both of you have these works in the shows with the stone that's kind of like obviously designed to be seen in several thousand years time, you know, these kind of the phones on the rock and then, you, you know, the carvings with the turtle and that sort of thing, where it's like designed to be a future perspective on the present, I guess. And so it's, um, it, maybe that. <laughs> well, I guess one, the long view of it. well, I guess one reason, I think one reason we both use the rocks is to say to people something about sculpture that, you know, doesn't have to be all the traditional ways of making sculpture with rock, uh, you know, um, materials. Well, yeah, and the, the sculpture, um, both sculptures come out of the idea rather than, you know, a fascination with form. <laughs> but it's, it's a concept yeah. that's important in the work rather than, you know, and, and exactly what you say there, you've, you've hit the nail on the head on how I feel, particularly about the, the stoneworks in my show there, is that um, when I was making them in my head, there is this narrative of they're almost relics of the future. And they, I think they absolutely represent um, something to do with uh, existence right now. Um, but they're, um, I think of the Elgin marbles and things like that, and I kind of almost, as I was creating them, I, I imagine that they, they might suggest that they're part of a much bigger thing, which, which you know, has yet to be discovered. Um, but will, they will literally be the things that will be left when, when we're dust. And so, um, yes, there is that sort of longer game, I guess, in that score. Conceptually and practically. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, so maybe I might, since we've been, been here for a bit, I might kind of draw that then as, to let people kind of go into the show with that in mind in terms of fragments of the present being kind of altered for the future as a way to kind of look at it. So, okay, well. Enjoy the show, that's yeah, for, yeah, 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 have a look.